he wasn't one to go to college, and so he had a little box of keepsake that he kept under his bed, and he fished around in there, and among his Navy medals and his lifeguard certificates and whatever else he had in there, maybe even a cigar from when the kids were born, you know, that kind of thing. He fished out his high school ring, which was a lovely piece of jewelry. And in big numbers on it, it said 1935. <laughs> I took that ring. And I wrapped and wrapped and wrapped twine around it and wrapped and wrapped some more and wrapped and wrapped some more until I could fit it on my finger. And I proudly wore it for a couple of years until one day a girl said to me, What is your father, your boyfriend? Is that why you're wearing his ring? And after that, I took it off and I put it into my jewelry box. I had one of those jewelry boxes where that when you lifted the lid, a plastic ballerina spun around. <laughs> anyway, that's where I kept it. One day my father said to me, I noticed that you don't wear my ring anymore. Did you lose it? <laughs> no, of course I didn't lose it, Dad. I have it in my jewelry box. And I got up from the table and went to my jewelry box to show him that I still had his ring. It wasn't there. It wasn't there. I had put it there. I had seen it every time I opened that jewelry box. Ding, 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 ding. It wasn't there. And so we began our contentious argument about where I would go to college. I got a $30,000 scholarship, but that wasn't enough for Princeton, where I was accepted. My father felt I couldn't live in New York City on that kind of money either. I'm not going to Nebraska. I'm not doing it. I'm not going. I won't do it. No, no, not Nebraska. Anywhere but Nebraska, no. Well, when he dropped me off in Lincoln, <laughs> I was pretty scared because we had driven there in the car. And when you drive across the Great Plains at night, you look out and there is utter darkness. I had never seen that before. The only place I had ever looked out and seen no lights was the Atlantic Ocean when I stood on the beach. And even then, you'd see an occasional boat come by. But it really scared me. What was I driving into? But when we got to Omaha, yay, there was a town. And I knew Lincoln was only 65 miles away. Lincoln was a town, too. And so I began my career at the University of Nebraska. I was not a football fan, but I was there anyway. And a year later, my sister followed behind me, my sister Chris. When she showed up, we had football tickets. We went to every game. She roomed with me because that was my father's dream, that we would be together. <laughs> we hated each other. <laughs> Ugh, that was the worst time. But while I was there, I happened to meet a gentleman who lived on my floor. I lived in a co-ed dorm. And this gentleman had something I really, really was attracted to. A hot plate. <laughs> he had boxes of cereal. He had food. He cooked bacon at midnight. <laughs> I was wild about it. <laughs> and we, were, we became good friends. And then, as I continued and pursued,
proceeded through school. It was time eventually when I graduated for me to go back to my home in New Jersey. When I got back there, my father suggested that I work with him in his real estate business. Ugh. There was something about him that caused me to doubt myself. I would say things like, I'd like to get a car. You can't handle a car. You couldn't handle a piece of jewelry. You're not responsible. <laughs> I thought maybe I shouldn't live at home. Maybe I should get a place of my own, a little room or a little apartment or something. You can't handle an apartment. You're irresponsible. You couldn't handle a piece of jewelry. You lose everything you touch. And I had this pattern of doubting myself that began to occur in my life. And so I embarked upon my real estate career <laughs> with my dad. Needless to say, it didn't work out. I became depressed. Depressed might be a mild word for what I was experiencing. I think I was suicidal. And I was, of course, dramatic about being suicidal. And so I thought about this gentleman that I had met at college, Jeff. He had been the health aide on our floor. He gave out throat lozenges and aspirin. And I remembered how he cooked and had cereal and other food readily available. I called him up. And I whined and I cried and I said, Jeff, I'm going to kill myself. I can't live with my family any longer. He knew how dramatic I was. So he said, really, what's going on? <laughs> At the end of our conversation, I begged him, Jeff, will you marry me? Will you marry me? If you marry me, I can move to Omaha and live with you for a while, and then we can get divorced. I'll move to California. You never have to see me again. Well, I like you. I don't want to never see you again, but we're friends. I don't want to mess anything up. Please, Jeff, please, marry me. Help me get away from my father. I can't believe I talked him into it. <laughs> was the baby of three sons. I saw as you were coming in tonight the age of the audience, so I know you will understand when I say that his two older brothers had to get married. <laughs> so his dad said, you're engaged to a woman from New Jersey. Does this mean I need to bring a shotgun to this wedding too? No. And his parents were so thrilled that I wasn't expecting that they had our wedding at their house. We weren't very religious at the time, so it worked out for us. And there we were, married. But I was in love with another man I had met at college who was off in the Northwest, somewhere around Mount St. Helens, finding himself. <laughs> I waited. One day, he came back to Omaha, and he visited us. Well, I was so excited. I was so mad about him. He came to visit Jeff and me at our apartment. And what happened, do you think? I had no choice but to compare him and Jeff. Jeff, it turns out, was a really nice guy. He cooked. He vacuumed. He even dusted. Whoa. <laughs> he made the bed. He took care of me. He was nice to me. He had great parents. This other guy smoked like a chimney. 
and when he drank beer, he belched loudly. And I worried every time he set his cigarette down on my coffee table that he was going to start a fire. I pictured my future with him. He was a mess. And I thought, I will just be spending my time cleaning up after this pig. And I'll be miserable. And we'll get divorced in an ugly way. Jeff and I will get divorced in a lovely way. <laughs> and I'll just move to California and we'll be friends forever. I couldn't help but compare the two men. And I decided to stay where I was. After a few weeks, I forgot all about going to California. And I settled into a rhythm. Jeff had a job. I had some part-time work. We got along really well, and I loved his parents. And they, because I wasn't expecting, loved me! <laughs> As it turned out, we stayed together. After 15 years, I thought, I've had enough of test driving this man. We had a real wedding, a recommitment ceremony, if you will. And we really got married. And I decided I wanted to have a family. You? The kid hater? He said. I said, I was in aerobics class, and I met some other women there, and they said, if you have your own child, you don't hate them so much. <laughs> I'm going on 40. I better have another child so this child will have somebody because we're not going to be around when she's an adult. Oh boy. During this time, as my two children grew up, I never introduced them to their grandfather. In fact, I told them he was dead. <laughs> He's a bad man. I didn't want him to meet them. And so one day, the phone call came. It was my sister, Chris. And she said, I got a call. Dad died in Mesa, Arizona sometime last week. He told the hospital he had no next of kin. He'd never been married, never had any family. <laughs> And so it took them over a week to track us down. But I'm on a plane tomorrow morning to Phoenix, she said. Well, she's my little baby sister. I'm on a plane to Phoenix too, I said. <laughs> and off we went to my father's apartment where he had lived out his twilight years <laughs> to do right by him, to clean the place out, to dispose of his possessions. He gave all his food to a food bank, gave his clothes to Goodwill, gave his furniture to the Salvation Army, turned in the keys. But here's what happened. Under his bed, I found his keepsake box with his Navy medals, his lifeguard certificate, and that cigar from when I was born. And in that box, I found his high school ring. And I saw that ring, and I remembered all the times that I could not be trusted because you can't even handle a piece of jewelry. And I made a decision in that moment I would never doubt myself again as long as I lived. I came back to Denver. I love Denver. And my sister flew back with me. And we came home. When I told my kids I had just gone to my father's apartment, they said, we thought your father was dead. <clears throat> and I remembered how I had told them years ago he was dead. And that was kind of embarrassing. But I told them he was a bad man. He was a bad man, and I'm so glad 
you never got the chance to meet him. Well, my sister and I, it turns out, are still Nebraska fans. She lives on the East Coast, but every fall, we make a pilgrimage to Lincoln, to that giant Memorial Stadium, and we go to a home game. We've been doing this for 30 years at least, maybe 40, I don't know, I've lost track. Every fall, we meet in Lincoln and go to a game. And that gentleman that I met in college, that wonderful man that I was planning to divorce, well, on May 10th, only 20 days from now, we're going to be married for 38 years. That's my true story. And that's a random event, a football game. Somewhere in some bowl in the South, probably the sugar bowl, the orange bowl, <coughs> the cereal bowl, some bowl. <laughs> Who knew that that would affect my life? And I invite you to consider what might be happening out in the world tonight that may be affecting your life.